until now we have talked about the energy analysis of closed systems and closed systems are applicable in many are found in many practical applications in real life. Uh, but now in this chapter, chapter 5, we will be looking at the mass and energy analysis of control volumes. In other words, systems that can have energy interaction because mass is entering or leaving the system, right? And such um, systems are to be found in everyday life. Um, the water heater that uh, is used to warm up the water for your bath in the morning is one such example. There are other examples such as pumps, turbines, um, compressors, diffusers, nozzles, throttling valves, everything that you might see around you or some of them that uh, you might not see because uh, they are they're not immediately in your surroundings but they are present, right? So open systems or control volumes as we like to call them are, are very practical, are found everywhere and so we need to know how to analyze the mass and energy and, uh, of, of such systems and this chapter is that is what it, this chapter is about. Um, before we begin uh, about energy, we need to look at mass and so we look at mass in the context of open systems, right? So uh, we are talking about chapter 5. And in this video, we will be talking about mass. So in closed systems, it is obvious that mass is conserved and that the mass of the system cannot change. But in uh, open systems or in control volumes, we do know that mass can enter or leave. And so we must account for mass entering and leaving a control volume. So we will be looking at that specifically in this video. Um, also uh, one thing to note is that mass can be inter interchanged with energy. So mass and energy can interchange. So and that equation is given by E equal to mc square where uh, if a mass m is destroyed then it results in an energy release of E and that uh, relationship between E and M is that E is equal to mc square. But this happens in very, very select applications such as nuclear reactors and so on. And so we will not worry about this equation so uh, for, for, this, um, for this course and we will assume that mass is conserved. In other words, mass cannot directly be converted to energy and vice versa. So we will always assume that mass is conserved, right. So <coughs> it is common knowledge that if I have a system, let us say I have a water tank, and uh, let us say I have a valve that uh, lets water into the tank and water out of the tank, right. And uh, so, and let us say this is my control volume here. Right. And let us say that both these valves are open, that is there is water inflowing into the water tank and there is also water going out of the water tank, but those two flows may not be the same, right. And let us say that I have a stopwatch and I watch uh, for delta t time, so delta t seconds, right. And let us say that initially to begin with the water level in the tank was that much, let us say this is H naught and after delta T uh, then my height of the water has let us say increased to this much and let us call this H of T, right. So uh, H at delta T, right. And this is uh, H at T equal to 0. Right. So, uh, water level has increased. So, what can we say about the water coming in versus the water going out? What we can say 
is that during this time delta t more water came in than went out right so that's common sense and so we'll now put it down into equations uh, and see how that works out so basically what we are saying is that the mass entering the control volume minus the mass leaving the control volume must be equal to the change in mass of the control volume, right. So because mass is conserved, mass cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, we already talked about the fact that mass will be conserved as far as this course is concerned. And so uh, m in minus m out must equal delta m c v. During this delta t period, whatever mass came in minus whatever left should be equal to the change of mass of the control volume, right. So uh, this is what is entering the control volume that is m in, uh, what is leaving is m out and uh, what is inside is m c v and that is changing and so therefore there is a delta m c v, right. And uh, if I differentiate this then I get m dot in minus m dot out equals d m c v d t, right. So uh, that also gives me another very useful equation because a lot of times what we know is the mass flow rate. We are less concerned about what happens over a period of time. What we are concerned about is what is happening instantaneously at this instant of time. And so therefore we talk in terms of mass flow rates that is in kgs per second. So this is a mass flow rate this is a mass flow rate uh, and although this has the same unit of kg per second, this is not a mass flow rate. This is rate of change of mass of the control volume. So uh, all of these obviously have the same units because they are in the same equation and so all of these have units of kgs per second but these two are mass flow rates which means the number of kgs of mass entering this control volume per unit time, the number of kgs of mass leaving this control volume per unit time. So that is those are m dot in and m dot out and that is why mass per unit time that is why it is kgs per second. Whereas uh, this term here is dmcv dt this is the rate at which the mass of the control volume is changing. So this is the rate at which the mass inside the control volume is changing and so that is not a mass flow rate that is the rate of change of mass and so that is why we write, write it as dmcv dt and not as m dot c v, right, because the dots remember signifies that something is crossing a boundary. Um, so so that is why we use dots, right, and so uh, this is very useful and then uh, of course this is valid only for uh, one inlet and one outlet. And so um, we do know from common sense that uh, suppose that I have instead of one entrance I have let us say two different pipelines that can potentially deliver water into this water tank and uh, uh, perhaps more than one exit out of the water tank that can take water away from it um, then I do know from common sense that I just have to sum all the inlets and sum all the outlets. So I can write uh, as a general case uh, sigma all in m dot minus sigma all outlets m dot should be equal to d m c v d t, right. So I take each inlet or I take each um, port where mass is entering the control volume and I, for each of those I sum over all the mass flow rates in all of those ports. I take each outlet port where the mass is leaving the control volume. Again I sum over all the mass flow rates that are leaving the control volume and then the difference between these should be equal to the rate of change of mass within the control volume, right. And uh, so uh, this is an equation that we will use uh, time and again.
sometimes um, we will have, uh, let us say I have uh, a tube a pipe that is delivering uh, liquid into a container, right. So, sometimes what will happen is that uh, I will know either the average velocity or I will know velocity as a function of the radius of that pipe, right. So, for example, if I plot velocity as a function of radius, that velocity might sometimes look like this, where the velocity is maximum at the center line of the pipe and minimum towards the edges and in fact goes to 0 right at the edge of the pipe where the water touches the pipe, right. So, this kind of velocity profile is very common, although not always you will have this kind of velocity profile. So, what I will do then uh, I will have is then I will have a velocity v as a function of radius r inside the pipe or if it is some kind of a rectangular conduit then I might have v as a function of x, right. So, what I need to do then is to take an average velocity and that is defined as v average and I will define v average as 1 over the area of cross section and uh, integral So, this is the area of cross section or the area of projection that is perpendicular to the flow that you are trying to calculate, right. So, uh, and so with this I can calculate the V average, many times I will know V average directly, right. And then once I know V average, I can calculate the mass flow rate M dot as uh, equal to rho times V average uh, times um, the area of cross section. So, uh, that is uh, the density times the average velocity times the uh, projection area or the in many times the area of cross section, right and uh, that is m dot. And uh, so, coming back, I am going to write down this equation again m dot in um, sigma in find its sigma out m dot equals uh, d m c v d t. Um, when we talk of steady flow devices, and there are many examples of steady flow devices that are found in everyday life. And when we talk about steady flow devices, um, what we understand by steady flow is that none of the variables change with time, right. And so, all the time derivatives go to 0 and so, there is only one time derivative in this equation and that goes to 0. So, what that means is that for a steady flow device, I have uh, sigma over all inlets m dot equals sigma over all outlets m dot whatever what that means is basically the rate at which uh, mass is entering the system should be equal to the rate at which mass leaving the system, right. And that is pretty straightforward to understand. And so, I can write this as uh, sigma over all inlets uh, rho uh, v average and um, uh, a c uh, equals out rho v average a c, right. And uh, so, I can have a special case where uh, fluid is incompressible. What we mean by incompressible is that its density does not change by much. Uh, when we have water flowing through a pump for example or water flowing through a water heater or uh, water flowing through a turbine. It is all most of the time safe to assume that the density of water does not change by much. And so, therefore, I can pull this density out everywhere at all the inlets and all the outlets, the density will be the same. And so, therefore, uh, I can pull that out and I can write uh, sigma in V average AC should be equal to sigma out 
V average AC. And in this case, when I write this, I am all, I am assuming that the fluid is the same in all the inlets and all the outlets. If the fluid is different, then I cannot obviously pull out this row because this will not be the same for different fluids. So for example, if uh, water and ethanol are mixing, then I cannot pull out row and cancel it out because the row of water is very different from the row of ethanol or methanol for example, right? So I cannot do that, but if the fluid is same and if the fluid is incompressible, then I can pull it out and equate this. Remember that the idea of incompressibility is not so much to do with the fluid, but the conditions at which the fluid is flowing. So many times we might be able to get away with believing that air is incompressible. We might be getting away with believing that uh, flow like for example, oxygen or nitrogen is incompressible. Uh, it's sometimes reasonable to assume that and sometimes it may not be reasonable to assume that water is incompressible. There may be some situations where water may behave uh, as a compressible substance. And so therefore, it's not so much the substance, but the conditions in which the fluid is flowing that we might be able to say the density remains constant or not, right? And uh, so that's that. And then we also define one more variable. And that is uh, the volumetric flow rate. And uh, V dot is defined as M dot divided by rho, right? So that in other words, that is equal to V average times AC. So uh, this is the volumetric flow rate and it has units of meter cube per second. This is meter cube. Right? And that's because I took kg per second and divided it by something that has units of kg per meter cube. And so therefore I am left with meter cube per second, right? Mm -hmm.